This is the After Party, live with Kim Callister. Pick a couch, grab a drink, and settle into the conversation. Hey, welcome to the After Party Live. Thank you for your patience as I get everything set and ready to go for the next show. Uh, Thanks for being here and thanks for hanging out with me on the Mark Thompson show as well. Again, Mark will be back tomorrow. So everything back to normal. But here we are. And there's some great stories coming up. Of course, Travel Tuesday today. And today, we're going on a virtual trip together to Scotland. I've always wanted to go. Maybe some of you have been. um, And I look forward to what you have to say in the chat about it. But I found the 20 best places to visit in Scotland. And maybe you have some of your own to add as well. So that's a little bit later in the show. Well, want to mention yesterday in the chat, we were talking about the baby stars that sneeze. And I forget who it was, whether it was a Mars or Mo Direct it starts with an M. One of you guys said something about how do you know which end it's coming from? You guys had me cracking up so funny. Um, and Heather, God, you guys are amazing. I love what you have to say in the chat. Keep the comments coming. Thank you to everyone who has contributed to the PayPal uh, link here on the After Party Live. That is hugely, hugely appreciated. Um, I just want to let you know that I have seen those come through. I am in the process of updating the end video with all the names. Um, But thank you, really, from the bottom of my heart. I so appreciate it. If you need to... um, help finding it, uh, you'll find the PayPal link in the bottom of the show description. It's also uh, the show description and also in the bottom of or in the the show description about what the after party live is about on YouTube. It's in there. And then every day we make a show, I make a show, I put it at the bottom as well. So you'll find that there. All right, enough about that. Oh, but I do want to ask you to click the like button uh, now that you're here. So thank you for doing that. All right, let's jump into it. What do you say? Let's get right right to the whole point. Um, there's this roundabout. It's a, a robo roundabout. It's called a turbo roundabout. And they put it at an intersection that's kind of notorious. This is um, kind of Gilroy area-ish, right? And it's at the intersection of highways 25 and 156. And there was always a big rig accident. A lot of agriculture in this area. So it seemed like there was constantly some type of overturned big rig or jackknife big rig right at this interchange, 25 and 156. So the big idea was to put this turbo roundabout in this area. And that was apparently the fix for all the accidents, right? This is what it looked like. Here it is. Wait, I have it. There you go. So this is the turbo roundabout. How are people doing with the turbo roundabout, you might wonder? Hmm. <laughs> Not so well is the answer. It's, maybe it's a little confusing. And since they put in this turbo roundabout, there's been even more accidents at this highway interchange. They finished it in February. And since then, they've seen a significant increase in the number of accidents. One crash every two and a half days on average. Previously, it was one crash every eight days. So you go from one every eight to one every two and a half days on average. So none of these, though, on the roundabout have led to serious injury or death. And the share of crashes that led to injury dropped. So there are more accidents, but they're less severe, you could say. Caltrans says, well, before you jump to conclusions here, let's just realize that people, there's a learning curve about how this whole roundabout situation operates, right? So drivers, they say, are still adjusting to this new feature. And that historically, there is a learning curve and that the analysis of accidents should take into account other details, like which portion of tra- of crashes can be attributed to driver error, like speeding, tailgating, distracted driving. Maybe it's not all the roundabout's fault. But there is an increase in interregional commuters during peak hours. So maybe more people aren't quite 
you know, figuring this out. There's more new people coming through. So it's taking longer for this to gel, you could say. They've released videos in English and in Spanish, Caltrans has, about how to use this new roundabout. There are signs, there are road markings, but some drivers are still confused. They're going on to social media saying, you know what? I don't understand the way this works. One driver telling the Mercury News, people are catching air driving over the lane dividers here. You see how they, they're they trying to, you know, put you into a certain lane. You have to pick a lane and, and go there. People don't know that, and they're driving over the lane device. It's a mess. Caltrans says, look, over time, people are going to understand this new format better. That these have been built around the state. Eventually, it catches on and greatly reduces severe traffic incidents. So there you go. So far, though, it's a little rough ride there through the Highway 25-156 interchange in the Gilroy area with the turbo roundabout. We'll check in on that one. Uh, next story, wanted to tell you about this one. This is um, an eclipse story. You may think, Kim, we're done with the eclipse. Well, yes, yes, we are. But when is the next American eclipse coming, right, To that will be here for us to see? And we know it's not going to be for a while, but there's an article about the reason we should stay alive for this is because it's apparently it's going to be cool. So if there's one thing giving you the will to live, Forbes has this article, Why to Stay Alive Until 2045 for the Greatest American Eclipse of the Century. They say, prepare for this. We had a four minute, 26 second totality on April 8th. But the Great American Eclipse in 2045 was going to bring us six minutes and four seconds. Possible from Florida. They say the this is why you need to stay alive until 2045. This is going to be the best eclipse on the celestial schedule for America's generation eclipse. When we see this, and you can kind of see the path of totality here, it's going to be 318 miles, this path of totality, on August 12th of 2045, in case you want to note that for the future. And it will stretch through 12 states. California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, slightly through Missouri and slightly through Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. So if you're into pre-planning, where are the best places to see this greatest American eclipse? Well, it turns out there's a great place to see it right here in California and in other states as well. Um, but here's what they say, where to watch. Mount Shasta, California. The totality there will be 1 minute 17 seconds. The Great Basin National Park in Nevada, 2 minutes 22 seconds. Here you are at Arches National Park in Utah with the picture, 4 minutes 15 seconds. Pikes Peak in Colorado, 5 minutes 10 seconds. Disney World in Orlando, Six minutes, two seconds. Kissimmee Prairie State Park in Florida. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, Port St. Port St. Lucie. Port St. Why can I not say that? Port Port St. Lucie in Florida as well. So the Great American Eclipse apparently uh, has some oddities going on. Uh, they say the total eclipse usually only occurs in the same place every 366 years. So this next one will beat the odds. Two center lines of the 2024 and 2045 eclipse cross in the Wachita National Forest. Other places to experience twin totalities include Smithville, Big Cedar, Hogan, and Page in Oklahoma. Uh, also, Mena, Hot Springs, Conway, Moralton, Russellville, Clarksville, Heber, Springs, and Searcy in Arkansas. So we got a couple overlaps there in case you're planning ahead. It should be cool to see it in Florida in at Disney World. That'd be kind of cool. I know, I know we make a lot of fun of Florida, but come on. Something really, really cool is happening, I have to tell you. 
And it's the Grunion Run. Have you heard of this? The Grunion Run. Kind of like sex on the beach for fish. But apparently, going out to watch the fish have the sex is really cool, I guess. I don't know. Supposed to be pretty fun. Here's the video from SF Gate of the Grunion Run. And what they say is that you'll see all of the silvery glints of the fish in the moonlight. You see thousands upon thousands of them covering the sand. They do it in, get it? They do it in two places, uh, on a Southern California beach, and then one in Baja as well. So thousands of tiny silver fish watch, wash up on the beaches late at night. They splash under the moonlight. They have as much sex as they can. And then it's over. And a lot of people go out and watch this happen. It only happens on certain nights in the spring and summer, depending on the moon and the tides. And these grunions are among the only fish species to leave the water to mate. They said, the biology professor at Pepperdine University, Karen Martin, nobody quite does it the same way the grunion does. They're the best, she says. So it's supposed to be stunning to see all of these slapping fish rolling around in all of these heaps. The California Grunions range extends from Point Conception north of Santa Barbara to Punto Abreojos in Baja, California. The Grunions are famous for their spawning behavior. People can't believe it when they see it happening. They say it's a beautiful phenomenon. Under the moonlight, you can see a flash of silver and you know a run is going to begin. And if you get a big run, according to Martin, the uh, Pepperdine biologist, you can see many, many grunion lining the shore, moving around in the whitewash. She said it's really quite amazing. So during the spring and summer months, the grunion leave the water on certain nights, following the new and full moons, and they wash up as the wave breaks on the shore. And then with each wave, piles and piles of fish get dumped onto the beach. And thousands of fish are hopping and flopping and wiggling. They almost look like snakes instead of fish. Here's what's happening, according to SF Gate. The female fish arch and twist their bodies to dig a little hole. And then they position themselves in their new nests tail first. So only their very tiny little fish heads are sticking out of the sand. And then they deposit their eggs in the nest. And then the male grunions wrap their bodies around the female grunion, sometimes several all at once, and release their milt, which flows down into the hole and fertilizes the eggs. Up to eight males can fertilize the eggs in one female grunion's nest. So maybe they're a little bit slutty. I don't know. Each female lays between 1,600 and uh, 3,600 eggs during one spawn. And they say females can spawn up to six times every season. So this is what you have to look forward to when you go to the grunion run. And here's some more pictures of this happening. Here's some people looking at all the fish on the shore. Getting a little close. I don't know, kind of back away. Here they are digging their holes and doing their thing. I don't know. There they are on the beach in the moonlight. I imagine it's quite a sight to see. The Grunion runs mostly occur from March through August. During consecutive four-day periods, they start with the night of the full or new moon, And then the runs happen over two-hour periods that vary each day, often quite late at night, anywhere from 9.30 p.m. to 2 a.m. So, apparently if you want to go to the Grunion sex party, (laughs) which is uh, open season, uh, March, July, August, people 16 and older with a California fishing license are actually allowed to take the grunion with their bare hands. That seems a little bit rude, but apparently you can scoop up 30 grunion a night. And you don't even need a net or any kind of advice. You just reach down and grab them. Easy taking. I mean, here's they are thinking. 
they're, you know, getting it on one minute, the next minute they're in your fish bag going home for to be fried up. <sighs> Grunion run. I've never seen one. I don't know if I would go out to try to see one, but the video is pretty cool. I have to tell you. Speaking of animals, this story is old. I will admit this to you. The story came out a while back, but I had never seen it. And I figure if I haven't, there might be some of you who haven't either. And I think it's fascinating. This is a story about climate change turning threatened sea turtles female. The solution to this is to keep the turtles cooler. Now, <clears throat> you might be wondering, as was I, how could climate change affect the gender of turtles? Well, it turns out that it really does. So uh, people, of course, most species, uh, sex is determined during the fertilization process, right? But in turtles, in crocodiles, alligators, these animal groups, it's the temperature of the developing eggs that's the deciding factor in influencing the sex of the hatchling. It's called TSD, Temperature Dependent Sex Determination. I had never heard of it. What well, you might have, I had never heard of it. So warmer temperatures produce more females than males. As you can see, what's happening with climate change, we've got a lot of female turtles rolling on, not a lot of boy turtles. Where is the boy turtles? The turtles usually lay their eggs in nests dug out on sandy beaches, warmer sand temperature due to climate change, heating these eggs beyond the optimal temperature needed to produce males. So researchers, uh, biologists, trying to save them, right? Because if there's only girl turtles, then we've got the end of a species. So they're experimenting with dif different types of methods to cool down these turtle nests. Uh, some of the things they're thinking about trying to cool them down the best way by the way is rainwater that's the thing that cool it seems to be the most effective but that's not always possible there was a study done in 2018 that found over 99 percent of hatchlings of green turtles on the great barrier reef were female the Rain Island, the world's largest turtle rookery, had been primarily producing females for the last two to three decades. And the green turtles sexually mature between 25 and 35 years old, which means, they say, we're only just starting to see the beginning of this problem with the adult population. Uh, whether it's uh, applicable to all turtle species, Apparently, they're all being affected by climate change at various stages of their life stories. So they all do it, exhibit temperature-dependent sex determination. And so we could have a hugely big problem here. Loggerheads, greens, right? So how do we fix this? Cooling off the nests. There are hatcheries that have, they're trying to put shade over. So if they know the turtles will come hatch on the particular beach in this stretch of sand, they're trying to put cover the sand with shade barriers, planting trees near where the turtles hatch so that will provide natural shade. And they've been doing this for a while, planting native trees, using fresh water where it's readily available to irrigate <clears throat> incubating clutches has been trialed in some locations. Seawater... Um, they think could dehydrate the eggs, so that doesn't look like something they want to, tr to do. But they're still brainstorming how they can get this turtle cooling done. So again, shading the fresh water, the irrigation. Climate change is expected to intensif intense change the intensity, the severity, and the variation of extreme weather events. So it could be that in the future they don't get enough rainfall to cool down the eggs, or produce any males at all. It's a problem. And it's kind of sad when you think about it. I mean, I know climate change affects us all in different ways, but this is just one of those. Look at this little turtle. I have to show you guys this picture. So cute. I mean, that's a beautiful picture right there, right? When you see the little baby turtle, something happens to my heart, and I just want to go out there and help save them. Look at that little one. 
Can you imagine if we have only female turtles left in the world? That'll be it. After their lifespans, there'll be no more beautiful sea turtles. Sorry, I know that's bringing down the party. Let's lift it right up. But something that, that I hadn't heard about before that I thought was important. How about this cat? This guy looks really unhappy, doesn't he? And he was just rescued. So you'd think there would be some type of joy. But no. This story is making news going viral because of the cat's expression on its face. This cat was rescued from between two walls by firefighters in England. Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service saying on social media that crews from Preston responded when this curious cat was found trapped between two walls. The firefighters had to chisel him out. The post goes viral online because the cat looks mad, doesn't he? Being held by the rescuer, they called him uh, Grumpy Cat. His real name is Tartar Sauce. <laughs> Speaking of good pet names. The facial expression on this cat making her tartar sauce grumpy slash grumpy cat an international celebrity. There you have it. This dog, this poor dog, apparently made its way out onto a balcony of a fourth story home in California. So there it is, four stories up on a very narrow balcony. And the dog gets stranded out there. Because there's no one home. So the dog goes out the door and the door closes behind it and no one is home. So people walking by see this dog standing up on the railing like this, stranded, and they call the fire department. So the fire department comes out. They had to use an aerial ladder bucket to reach this dog. They brought it safely back to solid ground. Thank goodness. Can you imagine? scary. Thank goodness for firefighters. I'll tell you. Apparently, we're not done looking for the Loch Ness Monster yet. There's all kinds of ways. We're always going to find a way to try to find the Loch Ness Monster. So this is a new search, and this one involves NASA. They're getting involved, apparently. They're being urged to help as this new search begins on the 90th anniversary of Sir Edward Mountain's expedition from the 30th of May to the 2nd of June. And NASA is now being asked to help look for Nessie. The Loch Ness Center is urging NASA to lend its expertise for a fresh hunt. They had done a search last year and they were using a hydrophone capturing loud underwater noises and they say there were several potential sightings. So on the 90th anniversary of Sir Edward Mountain's expedition, they're going to try again with a search for the Loch Ness Monster. On the Watchers of the Monster, there have been more than 1,156 sightings, according to the official Loch Ness Monster Register. They say they're hoping Nessie hunters around the world will help them reach the people at NASA. We're hoping to reach them through the power of social media. We're just hoping for their expert guidance to help with our ongoing quest to get answers. They say, we've gone to UK universities, and we're hoping that experts from NASA might have some advanced imaging technology to scan the lock. We would have to sit down and talk to them about how to get it here. <laughs> I don't know. So far, no word from NASA on this. No. But they can go out on a boat, people that are looking for Nessie, with deep scan captain Alistair Matheson, who's the skipper for the Loch Ness Project, and use this hydrophone again to listen for mysterious sounds echoing from the depth of the loch. Last year, they said we captured the world's attention with one of the biggest ever searches for Nessie. There were people from America, Canada, France, Italy, Japan that had all gathered there to help look. They heard unexplained noises. They had possible sightings. And this year, they're saying they want the experts to come in. 
They say they want to make it the biggest search ever as they look for new equipment to help uncover the biggest mysteries of the lock. I don't know if NASA's going to go for it. That might be something like, oh, I don't know, say a waste of time, perhaps? Yeah. I'm not thinking that NASA's going to partake. Be interesting if they found something, though. I don't know. All right. This next story, something cool found in an old house. Not necessarily your traditional time capsule, but something that appears to have been left behind by a small child, maybe. Something, something, some items that they thought may be worth saving. Check this out. After a Grand Rapids resident finds a time capsule in their home, 13 on your sides, Kiara Patterson has more details about the discovery. And Kiara, how did the homeowners react to finding this capsule? Yeah, Lauren, the homeowners were ecstatic. They say the whole process of how the time capsule was discovered is fascinating. It all started a few weeks ago when there was a boil water advisory in Grand Rapids, which caused Grand Rapids homeowners heater to fail. Basically, as they were cutting into the ceiling above the bathroom, they, it wasn't in a box. It was just all this stuff kind of set in a pile, basically. People came in to fix the heater and pipes in the house. As they started cutting through walls and the ceilings, they found artifacts and newspapers dating back 1915. The homeowner's initial reaction was that he thought the whole thing was really cool. Yeah, I just thought it was really cool because, you know, I had, you know, I, I've always kind of thought about doing stuff like that. You know, if we renovate the place, leave something on the wall for the next guy. And so I just, I just thought it was extremely cool and just gave me a connection to the, you know, I knew this place was built in 1910. And so it's just a really old building and made me think about, you know, obviously some, some kid living here thought, thought this stuff was important to stick around for the, some for the next guy. Leach says 12 items were found in total. He also says he's found some old treasures in his house before in his bathroom. So maybe this is for playing. His daughters say they're surprised all the stuff survived in their home. I think it's pretty cool that all of this stuff just survived for the workers and we had a bunch of nice problems who would want to get to all this paper, most definitely. From the items that were found, Leach says he plans to keep and use most of them. But with the cast iron pan, I think we want to clean the rust out of it and try try like cooking some tiny, tiny food with it and see how that works cooking over a tea light. Um, the other thing is, yeah, I kind of want to just hold on to, you know, maybe with with this, I, I, you know, I make music uh, kind of by myself mostly, but I, I kind of want to record these and see if I can make something interesting out of them. The homeowner says he's been told in Grand Rapids, it's not uncommon for people to find time capsules or artifacts in their homes. In the newsroom, Kiara Patterson, 13, on your side. So pretty cool. Um, my house is from the 70s. I don't think there's anything interesting to find here. So when I see a story like that uh, with someone that has an old home, you never know what you're going to find when you break into the walls. Um, here's a story. It's another world record, right? I'm telling you, these world records, what people will do. This one involves balancing a lawnmower that's running on your chin. Yeah, apparently that <laughs> that's a pastime for some people trying to practice this. This man has set a new world record with the people from Guinness. He's balanced a running lawnmower on his chin for 9 minutes and 17 seconds. That's a new world record for David Rush. He's, he's actually trying to hold the most concurrent Guinness world record titles. He tried to do it about four years ago, but his time of three minutes, 52 seconds was disqualified because his lawnmower didn't have a bag on it. Aha, has to have a bag. So the record was increased in the meantime to seven minutes, two seconds by another person who's a serial record breaker. Finally, Rush scoops in and finishes his attempt at 9 minutes, 17 seconds. He was trying to get to 10 minutes, so didn't quite make the goal, but still took the title. The record brings his total concurrent titles to 165 wacky 
Guinness Book of World Record titles. I mean, how much extra time do you have on your hands to do something like this? But there he is. Here's another shot of him balancing this running lawnmower on his chin. And apparently they put a camera on it because now we can see him or someone has a drone one way or the other because we can see him balancing it on his chin. Wild. Come on now. The record brings him to 165 titles. So he's trying to, to beat this man named Silvio Saba, who currently holds 180 different Guinness Book of World Record titles. I guess that maybe that for some people is your hobby, seeing what kind of Guinness World Record you could break. I would think one record would be enough, but hey, 180, 165, I guess go get it, right? From the wacky back to the sad. We bring you up and then we bring you down. This is um the world's coral currently undergoing another bleaching event. Sadly, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, announcing just yesterday that the world's oceans are now undergoing the fourth global coral bleaching event on record, and it's just the second in the last 10 years. They say they're documenting extensive bleaching level heat stress on coral reefs across the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean basins during the last 14 months. So that's why they've now called it that it's a new global bleaching event underway. It's been confirmed in at least 53 countries, this mass bleaching, territories and local economies. The previous global bleaching event started in the North Pacific in the summer of 2014, and it went on for three years, ending in 2017. So from February of 2023 to April of 24, significant coral bleaching has been documented in both the northern and southern hemispheres of each major ocean basin. That according to the NOAA Coral Reef Watch program. The scientists are looking at sea surface temperature data. Um, they're looking at satellite imagery as well. And they've been able to confirm mass bleaching of coral reefs throughout the tropics since 2023, including Florida here in the U.S., the Caribbean, Brazil, eastern tropical Pacific, including Mexico, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, large areas of the South Pacific and elsewhere. This announcement from NOAA comes less than a week after the Australian government reported that more than 60% of individual coral reefs across the Great Barrier Reef have shown prevalent bleaching, uh, bleaching as well. Why is it happening? Guess why? Scientists are blaming the phenomenon on the overall warming of the Earth's oceans, including an unprecedented marine heat wave in Florida last year, which environmentalists say lasted longer and was more severe than any previous event that we know of in that region. And the thinking is that as the world's oceans continue to warm, coral bleaching will become more frequent and more severe. When these events are sufficiently severe or prolonged, they can cause coral mortality, which hurts the people who depend on the coral reefs for their livelihoods. So, now the bleaching doesn't necessarily mean the coral will die, but it does lead to impacts on local economies, livelihoods, food security, and this. Uh, more than 500 million people worldwide depend on coral reefs for food, income, and for protection as well. So here we are in the middle of another bleaching event. I wanted to tell you about this story because it kind of surprised me until I started looking at the uses. Apparently, the MetaQuest VR may be coming to the classroom. No, teachers say, we're not using this unless we have complete visibility and control over what's happening. And my first thought when I saw the headline was, why would you want to bring virtual reality into the classroom? But it has uses like allowing kids to visit museums in a virtual way, practice speaking different languages, right? You could immerse yourself in language in a different culture. 
enter 3D versions of environments that they otherwise couldn't access. So Meta is introducing a feature called Shared Mode, in which kids won't be able to access MetaQuest to store, uh, download new apps or games. Others won't know the identity of the school user. They think they're going to have this situation where it'll be an engaged, participatory, immersive experience than is currently the case in the classroom, and that it will be safe because teachers will be fully in control of it. I don't know. Do you think it? I'm going to the chat. Do you think we need this? Right now, the number of monthly active users across the metaverse platforms, 600 million. I didn't know 600 million people have these contraptions. I must be out in the cold over here. The vast majority of metaverse users are children. 84% of users are under 18. 51% of total users, 13 and younger. Uh, young people need to be protected in the online world whenever they access it. And the teachers agree with this one. So I don't know. I mean, teachers are saying this. Every time you have a new technology, whether it's a calculator or whether it's a whiteboard that becomes mainstream education over time, you've always got an early adopter issue, which is the technology tends to be more expensive at the beginning than it is at the end as the volume ramps up. Therefore, he said, it's easier for schools and colleges with more means to use this technology earliest. And all we can try to do is make the technology as affordable as we can. The education product is expected to be launched by Meta earlier this year. Now, I could imagine maybe if you were teaching a history lesson, you could immerse your students into a battle or into that time frame, right, where you could all put on your little headsets and you would be sitting in, you know, the era of that war, Civil War, World War II, whatever. And that then history becomes real to you. Or if you're teaching language that, you know, you Im say you're trying to learn Spanish and you immerse yourself in a Mexican town where all the virtual people are speaking to you in Spanish, it would be maybe like immersing yourself into a real culture and learning the language. Maybe for science, you know, you find yourself in the middle of a nucleus. I don't know. I don't know. Um, this show is not pre-recorded. This show is live, my friend. Mm -mm. Live as live can be. Lori writes, I think lots of cool things for use in the classroom. Definitely the teacher needs to, a way to see what the kids are seeing. This exists with other tech used by kids where teachers have a dashboard um, of what's on the kid's screen. It's true. Although, do we want kids to be more to have more screen time, you know, to spend their educational hours looking at a screen instead of learning in other ways that, you know, touching things or, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure about this. I'm on the fence, Lori. I'm on the fence. Lori says it could be good for kids with certain special needs. That's true. Doug says I've talked to him into it. It's educational. Maybe not me. Maybe it was Lori that talked him into it. I don't know. Mama says, I can't see it possibly being beneficial for kids with, oh, I can see it. She says, being possibly being beneficial for kids with anxiety or sensory issues, allowing them to learn without necessarily being in the classroom. Well, I think in this particular case, you would be in the classroom. You just have this thing on your head. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, Lori says, remember the incredible journey traveling through the bloodstream? Well, it's kind of like, um, what is that, Miss Frizzle and the Magic School Bus? We've watched a lot of that in my house and done a lot of the Miss Frizzle experiments where the bus shrinks down, you know, and you're going through the Earth's core or you're going through the bloodstream or you're going through the human body or whatever it is. So those things are interesting. And this could be another tool like that. I don't know if I trust it. I think that's the problem here. John talking about the military might finding a way uh, to use it and train, find or train drone pilots, possibly. I mean, there are a lot of different uses that it would have, right? 
and they're not all video games and time wasters. So, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I have concerns about it. I'm not quite ready to sign off, I don't think. But there's a lot of people who, oh, maybe it's the Fantastic Voyage, perhaps. Um, There's a lot of people who are really against the use of iPads in the classroom. I think as long as they're not overused, they can be a great tool. Because we live in a society where kids have to learn to use these things. Most of them are better at using them than than I am, which isn't saying much. But if you restrict education from learning about technology, then you're kind of leaving a big gap in the knowledge. But there are some moms who take the kindergarten tour and they're like, I don't want any iPads. I don't want any um, education that involves my child watching a screen or looking at a screen. So I don't know. Um, Sandy says, I used to love that ride at Disneyland. It was my favorite ride when I was a kid. Yeah, you're talk- talking about Fantastic Voyage, I think. Yeah. Was there a Fantastic Voyage remake movie? I don't know. We need to look into it, I think. Interesting. All right. It is Travel Tuesday. And before we head off to Scotland, I wanted to show you this really interesting video that I found about a tourist attraction in Japan. And it's one of these immersive kind of things where you walk in and you're in a whole other world. So it's from Team Lab Planets, and this is in Tokyo. But here's what it looks like. And it it honestly looks pretty incredible, I have to say. I mean, it's all video, right? Kind of. People are touching things. It's just this immersive, interesting thing. So here's what they're saying. You can walk through water. You can walk through a garden where you become one with the flowers. It's a first for Japan chosen as a winner of Asia's leading tourist attraction of 2023 at the World Travel Awards, referred to as the Oscars of the travel industry. It's a museum where you walk through water and a garden where you become one with the flowers. Renovated in celebration of five years since opening, alongside the introduction of the new artwork, Ephemeral Solidified Light, taking Team Lab Planets to the next level of creating an overwhelmingly immersive space. So this is currently being held in Toyosu, Tokyo. The exhibition uh, is being extended to the end of 2027. And that's what they got. I mean, it looks like such an incredible experience, doesn't it? I went to the Van Gogh, the Living Van Gogh exhibit in San Francisco. And it was really cool, but you never forgot that you were watching things projected on a wall. Even though the pictures were moving all around you and there was music, you never felt like you weren't looking at a wall, right? But this apparently is supposed to make you feel like everything is happening all around you, which could be a bit dizzying, I would think, but also... What an experience. Well, I don't know. See, in this one, it looks like everything's on a wall around you. But here they are in the flower garden. I mean, kind of cool to just sit there being in the middle of it all, I guess. I was probably not going to smell like real flowers. But yeah. So again, that's in Tokyo. Kind of an interesting thing they've got going on. All right, you ready to go to Scotland? Let's do it. Where were we last time? Did we go to Italy? I think we were in Italy. This time we're going to Scotland. So I found the top 20 places to visit in Scotland. And we'll start here at the National Museum of Scotland. There it is. It doesn't look super exciting, I would say. But all right. I'll go there with the hope that we're getting to the castles later on. I like a good art museum, but you know... It's not where I'm stopping first, all right? This is the National Museum of Scotland. It's in Edinburgh. They have 
uh, ancient artifacts and precious objects. All right, piquing my interest. It's one of the most popular museums in the UK outside of London. They've got a year-round program of temporary exhibitions and events, etc. All right, now we're out of the museum and we're going to the castle. Let's do it. We're going to Edinburgh Castle. It's an icon of Scotland. It's dominated the skyline of the capital for centuries. It's set atop an extinct volcano. It's Scotland's most visited paid for attraction. I would definitely want to go up here. I don't know how you, if you can drive up there, if you have to hike up there, I don't know. But how beautiful is that? I'm in, I'm going. Let's stop off now at another museum. We're going. This is the uh, the Scottish National Gallery, also in Edinburgh. They have a collection of fine art from the early Renaissance to the end of the 19th century. Masterpieces from Raphael, Velasquez, Vermeer, Monet, Cezanne, Van Gogh, Scottish artists as well. There's more museums coming up, don't worry. Like this one, the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum in Glasgow. Now in this one, I just want to go for the building. How cool is that to be in there? This, they say, is a place you'll want to keep coming back to time and time again. It's set next to a classic Victorian park by the River Kelvin in Glasgow. They've got 8,000 objects, 22 beautiful galleries. Kelvin Grove, it's called. And with that, we're off to another museum. This one is Riverside. It's called the Riverside Museum. And it's cool looking. I mean, look at the shape of that structure. It sits on the River Clyde, home to the Glasgow Museum of Transport full of, they say, objects and vehicles telling the story of Scotland's past and present. One of the top places to visit in Scotland and a must visit when you're in Glasgow. So, it's cool. Whoever designed that, it kind of looks like an EKG to me, right? A, a sinus rhythm. But it's cool looking. Next, we're headed to the... Royal Botanic Garden. Mm -hmm. This is founded in 1670. It is considered to be one of the finest gardens in the world. The Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh offers 72 acres of peace and tranquility. It's a stone's throw from the city in this area. I'd walk through there. What a peaceful, lovely afternoon. Back to the museums again. Scotland wants us to go see the National War Museum, also in Edinburgh. It's in Edinburgh Castle, actually, filled with exhibits and artifacts telling the impact of the war on Scotland's history, identity, and reputation abroad. Interesting. This, I don't think, is a place I would go. If I'm going to visit a country I've never been to before... I'm probably not going to stop off to see the giraffes that I could see at the San Francisco or the Oakland Zoo. But this is the Edinburgh Zoo. They have a thousand animals from every corner of the globe. <clears throat> they call it a fantastic day out. Eh, I'm probably leaving it off my itinerary. But this is on the itinerary for sure. This is Glenfinnan Monument in the Scottish Highlands. Look at that. It's beautiful. It was... Um, it is an epic tourist attraction uh, built to honor the fallen Jacobite clansmen. The Glenfinnan Monument overlooks Loch Shiel. It's backed by the world-renowned Glenfinnan Viaduct. So, uh, there's a kilted Highlander who stands atop the monument here. That is incredibly beautiful. That's on my... Are you putting that on your itinerary? That's on there as well as this one. This is Stirling Castle. Look at that. Hard to believe some of these places survived. 
It is not one of, it's not only one of the finest and best preserved Renaissance buildings in all of the UK, Stirling Castle was also the favored residence for many of Scotland's kings and queens. It sits atop volcanic rock overlooking the River Forth, and it was the childhood home of Mary Queen of Scots. Can you believe you can actually go to these places and walk through? Back to the museums. This one is the Gallery of Modern Art in Glasgow. It's Scotland's most visited art, visited art gallery and the center for Glasgow's extensive modern and contemporary art collection. It's in the Royal Exchange Square. Right out in front, you can see that statue. It's the Duke of Wellington statue guarding out front. Usually there's a traffic cone on top of his head. <laughs> and apparently this is free to enter. You can go into this museum, no cost. Uh, the Burrell collection, they say, is also something cool to see if you're in Scotland. It's in uh, Pollock Country Park in Glasgow. They've refurbished it. There's 9,000 objects spanning a 6,000 years of history and art from major artists there as well. There are a lot of um, museums in Scotland, but check this out. I'll go here. It's the Glasgow Cathedral. So old and pretty. It's a medieval cathedral thought to have been built on the site of St. Kentigern's tomb. It marks the birthplace of the city of Glasgow, one of Scotland's most magnificent medieval buildings. Glasgow Cathedral is the only one on the Scottish mainland to survive the Reformation of 1560 intact. You can see the carved stone bosses on the ceiling of uh, Black Blackadder Isle, which is one of the finest post-war collections, they say, of stained glass windows in Britain. I'd want to see that. I'd also want to see this. Kind of ruins, but still, look at that. So pretty. This is Urquhart Castle in Inverness. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. Ur Urquhart, Urquhart Castle. It's had some dramatic moments in its history. No battles during your time here, though, but they say you can step back in time and uncover the history behind the famous castle ruins left by the residents, historic replicas, and much more. Make sure to climb, they say, up to the Grant Tower, where you'll enjoy glorious views of one of Scotland's most famous lochs, Loch Ness. Maybe you'll see Nessie. I don't know. How about... Holyrood House. Yep, this is where I'd want to go. The Palace of Holyrood House. It's an elegant royal residence with links to monarchs throughout the centuries. It's at the foot of the Royal Mile. The building, they say, is an architectural gem with impressive Baroque decorations in its interior. The palace beautifully decorated with tapestries, portraits of the royal family, antiques. You can take a tour. Um... You can learn about some of Scotland's most well-known historic figures. Again, Mary Queen of Scots, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And then there's ruins of the 12th century Holyrood Abbey and the Royal Gardens on site as well. So that would be really cool to see. Now to the fun stuff. This is the Johnny Walker experience, right? It's in a landmark building right in the heart of Edinburgh. The flagship Johnny Walker experience offers a personalized whiskey experience where you can explore the flavors of Scotland. A hot spot, perfect for whiskey lovers and novices alike. There are dining experiences, bars, a whiskey retail area, craft cocktails, immersive tastings, shop whiskeys they say you won't find anywhere else. I'm not sure what VA means in this context, but this is V&A Dundee. It's the first V&A museum in the world. I'm going to the chat. Tell me if you know what V&A means. It's the first ever dedicated design museum in Scotland. The V&A Dundee, they say, is not to be missed. So you're guaranteed a fantastic experience with permanent changing displays showcasing work from around the world in this UNESCO city of design. Okay, going to the chat to see if you guys know. Not seeing it. 
I was wondering, John says, when we get to the single malt scotches. Yes. Calvin says, uh, oops, you must pass the Johnny Walker test to get drunk on their whiskey. Oh, Victoria and Albert. Okay, cool. Thanks, Mars. Appreciate it. It does look pretty cool, doesn't it? Yeah. I like it. All right. Next, we're headed to Glencoe. Can't go to Scotland without a stop here. The Glencoe Visitor Center in the Highlands. It's at the foot of the Glen, the award-winning Glencoe Visitor Center, an essential starting point for adventures in Glencoe and Glen Etive. You get a taste for the stories that make the Glencoe National Nature Reserve so special, and you can plan your visit here, learn about the Clan MacDonald, the Massacre of 1692, discover world-famous film locations such as those used in Harry Potter, Outlaw King, Braveheart, Skyfall, and more. You can go on a wildlife Land Rover safari tour with a ranger or climb and just admire one of the eight Monroe Mountains that tower above the Glen. Sold me. Victoria, no. oh, thank you. Yeah, saw that. Sorry about that. Um, This is the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. Uh, it's in Edinburgh, one of their most iconic buildings, and they say it's worth visiting. So, I don't know. By this point in our adventure, I'm kind of museumed out, but I'm headed this way. I'm going to the Colsian Castle and Country Park in Ayrshire. It's a majestic cliff-top castle tucked away in the Ayrshire countryside in an outstanding coastal location. It's a regal exterior, an intricate interior, pristine garden, 260 hectares of grounds to explore. They say it's a wonderful day for a, a family day out. So, thus concludes our trip to Scotland. Do you feel like you went? Nah, I don't know. There were some pretty pictures, though. Too many museums for my taste. That's, I mean, maybe I'll throw one or two on the itinerary, but I don't think I'm going museum hopping. That's not the whole point. Maybe I'll go to the whiskey experience, catch a few castles, do a little shopping on the Royal Mile. I've always wanted to go see the Isle of Skye, though. I don't know. All right, today before I leave you, I'm going to the chat. Oh, you say visual and architecture. I I think it's Victoria and Albert. I think I think Mars might be right about this one. But maybe you're right. I'll have to look it up. Um, Lori says I'd want to see the ancient druid stuff. Yeah. Well, like the um the the outlander stones, those type of things. Uh Doug says Hairshire is a beautiful word. Is it a picture or a painting? I'm not sure of which one. I think they were all real pictures that I showed you. Um, who, uh, v and A Dundee is the first V and A museum outside the London Museum. Yes, I know, but I was trying to figure out what V and A means. Oh, I th you're saying Victoria and Albert, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, SF Tesla says I didn't observe any schools there, young people or university. If you're talking about Scotland, I know there's um some amazing universities there, with beautiful architecture to go see as well. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope we had fun. Thank you for hanging out with me on the After Party Live. Please click the like button. Again, thanks to everyone who has checked in on the PayPal situation and kicked in if you are so inclined to do so. I will see you tomorrow. Nikki Maduro show in its abbreviated version and recorded version starts at 10 a.m. And that follows the Mark Thompson or that precedes the Mark Thompson show, which starts at 11. Again, tomorrow we'll visit with John Rothman and Belinda Weymouth with It's the Planet Stupid. And then I'll see you back here for the after party live for our Wednesday. Until then, make it a great day and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. The after party live would like to thank the following contributors and viewers like you.